The newest wave of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty spoilers have just been revealed. We have a sword that is so wrong. We have a crazy shrine and a heartbreaking dog. Magic. I am a wizard. History. I'm an old wizard. The magic historian. My bones hurt. Greetings. Owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles, my friends, I hope the day finds you well because we have gathered to talk about some crazy Kamigawa Neon Dynasty goodness. Before we do that, just want to let you know, if you are a long-term fan of mine, breakfast streams are back on the menu. Just did one today over on my Hatcher channel. I'll leave the link for you at the end of this video if you want to go and check it out. But if you're not familiar with those streams, don't bring your kids. Not exactly family friendly. Anyhow, let us dive into to the spoiler cards, the first thing I want to talk about is the Crazy Shrine. I am a huge fan of crazy wonky green cards and the Go Shintai of Life's Origin is absolutely fascinating to me. So we have a mix today of Commander Deck Kamigawa cards and the regular Kamigawa set cards. This one is from one of the Commander decks. One green and three gets you a 3-4 legendary enchantment creature that counts as a shrine. It has pay one green, one red, one black, one blue, and one white and tap it. Return target enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. And whenever Go Shintai of Life's Origin or another non-token shrine enters the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 one, one colorless shrine enchantment creature token. And they actually made a shrine token to go with it. I'll show it to you in a second. But first, take a look at the absolutely insane artwork here. You can see some kind of like primordial being. It feels like a nature essence that is bursting forth out of the walls of like a miniaturized shrine. This is some really weird artwork. The, the eyes and everything, it looks kind of like a fish face, but the eyes almost make it look like the fish isn't even alive anymore. It is a very intense concept overall and a cool one. The idea of this overlord spirit of shrines. I love the way that they brought back the original Kamigawa shrine concept, but really did innovate on it because it really feels like you can have way more options now when building a shrine deck. They didn't just go, hey, you know what? We're just going to go shrine enchantment. It counts the number of enchantments and does this thing. We're going to also mix in the concept that these are now creatures too. So I said I would show you the one, one colorless shrine enchantment creature token. Take a look at it. This, in my estimation at least, is the least likely looking creature token ever made in Magic. And by that I mean, when you look at the artwork, you don't think of that as a creature token. You think of maybe it would be an artifact token, a clue token, something like that, right? But it is neat. Now, let us move on to the sword that is so wrong. This is Eater of Virtue. This is a crazy concept to me. One mana gets you a legendary artifact equipment. Whenever equipped creature dies, exile it. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus zero. And as long as a card basically, okay, here's how it works. As long as a card exiled with Eater of Virtue has flying, the equipped creature has flying. And then the same thing applies to the other abilities for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Haste, Hexproof, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, Protection, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance. And this thing has an equip cost of one. So it does kind of give a little bit of the Audric vibe because that's who I think of when I think of caring about what abilities your creatures have and kind of transferring them to other creatures. It is an ability we've seen used in a number of different ways. It just resonates most strongly with me in terms of Audric. Now, the way they do it with Audric doesn't always work as we saw with the most recent iteration of him. But returning to the Eater of Virtue. Basically, this is a super cheap to put out, super cheap to equip piece of equipment that will give your creature a power bonus. When that creature goes, it's going to get exiled by the sword and it's going to transfer any abilities that creature has to any creatures that get equipped with the sword going forward. So 
on the surface, this is something you have to feed a bunch of creatures in to get a range of abilities. But the fact that it costs almost nothing to put out and nothing to equip means it's going to be very easy to meet grinder creatures. You can just play tiny little creatures that have particular abilities, slap this on them. If they were just a 1-1 flyer, now it's a 3-1 flyer. They have to deal with it or they're going to get donked in the air every turn for three. And if they do deal with it, well, now the Eater of Virtue automatically adds flying to your next creature. You put out a 1-1 with lifelink, slap this sword on it, all of a sudden it's a 3-1 flyer with lifelink. It gets taken out, great. The next creature now gets plus two, it also gets flying and lifelink. And you can go down the chain that way, right? But where the card actually feels genuinely wrong to me is actually in the flavor concept. To me, this is a blade that essentially feels like it should be black aligned because it steals people's souls, right? The idea is when a creature dies, it's exiled. Its soul is pulled into this blade. Like you cannot resurrect it. You cannot bring this creature back from the grave because it's been pulled from existence. Its soul is now trapped inside this sword. And you have to understand that my perspective on Magic the Gathering is the original perspective where planeswalkers, which are us as the players, we go around to different planes of existence and we make bonds with different creatures and things like that. And we can summon them through the blind eternities, but we're summoning the actual being. So if you summon up a Shiv and Dragon, you actually went to Shiv, linked up with the Shiv and Dragon. And then when you're on whatever plane, Ravnica, wherever it is, when you summon in the Shivan Dragon, it's an actual Shivan Dragon that's appearing, and if it gets destroyed, it's gone for good. That Shivan Dragon doesn't exist, and as a Planeswalker, you would have to go and find another one. Now, obviously, we have shorthand with our magic decks where we have the cards to represent it, but that's the underlying flavor concept. Now, in more recent times, Wizards of the Coast found that unpalatable, so they changed the idea of Planeswalkers, and they say Planeswalkers only make construct copies of people, which to me diminishes the intensity of what's going on. I do recognize that from the perspective of somebody who's engaging in titanic magical battles, having the ability to create endless copies of your creatures would definitely be beneficial, having to go and capture new copies each time. But to me, it diminishes the flavor and it makes something like the Eater of Virtue feel empty and hollow. If you're just consuming constructs, they don't even really have souls, right? They're just simulacra. They are fakes. They are automatons, robots with no real being to them. When you look at it from the perspective of the original concept of magic, these are the souls of actual beings that are being forced into this blade. How is it not black aligned, right? Like the whole eater of virtue concept, but the thing is that you don't have to be virtuous. You could be the most foul-hearted demon and wield this blade. And if you had the right ability, the sword is still going to absorb it and bequeath it onto others. So this is somewhat of a muddy concept. I think the idea is supposed to like, eater of virtue sounds like an inherently negative thing, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like a neutral item. It sounds like something you want to avoid. This to me, this sword is so wrong and so cool on multiple levels. Now, my friends, let us move on to the next card that we're gonna talk about. This is the Ruthless Technomancer. He's a bit of a weird one. One black and three for a two, four human wizard. When Ruthless Technomancer enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature you control. If you do, create a number of treasure tokens equal to that creature's power. And it has the ability, pay one black and two, sacrifice X artifacts, return target creature card with power X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. X can't be zero. Now clearly this is the kind of guy who's gonna shine in a flicker style deck where you can have him come back into play multiple times because his first ability where you sack a creature has basically an equal setup with his second ability. So if you sack a creature with three power, you're going to gain three treasure tokens. His second ability would allow you to sack those three treasure tokens and get a creature back from your graveyard with power three or less. So this can be used obviously to resurrect different creatures from your graveyard, or if you can flicker this guy, it turns into a way to recur multiple creatures. So basically you can go, I'm gonna flicker the Ruthless Techromancer, he comes in, I sack this creature, then I sack the tokens to bring them back. The creature I came back from the graveyard does its enter the battlefield trigger. Next turn, 
flicker the Tecromancer again, bring it back, boom, you know, just kind of rinse and repeat. It's one of those cards where you can get a lot of value out it, out of it, I should say, over time. And the artwork is pretty intense too, with this old man standing there doing the power pose, yelling to the heavens, I shall sacrifice you all to my robot gods! I love it. It's... It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Speaking of ridiculous, Invoke the Ancients is ridiculous to me. As a mono green player, I'm so stoked about this dude. Four green and one for a sorcery that says create two, four, five green spirit creature tokens. For each of them, put your choice of a vigilance, a reach, or a trample counter on it. Like what? Five mana gets you two, four, five Basically like tree folk. Yeah, they're spirits, but it feels like tree folk to me, right? And you get to slap on extra abilities. This is so crazy. And my first thought when I saw this card was, did Wizards of the Coast really think that Essica's Chariot would be fine with this? Like, they literally nerfed Essica's Chariot for Arena, right? They changed, uh, not Arena, I should say, for Alchemy on Arena specifically, right? Like, they know it's too strong. And they were going to have this flowing around with it. It is. It's Asuka's Chariot and this are going to be legal together. I guess I'll swing with this and make a copy of my four five spirit tokens. Like, sure, they're not going to get the lifelink or whatever. Not lifelink, sorry. The, um, the reach, vigilance, or trample counters. But it's still going to be bonkers, right? Like, I love this card. The artwork shows a couple of tree folk spirity kind of guys getting ready to come and smack you in the mouth for opposing me i can't wait to use this card i wish it was an instant but i mean that would probably be a little too broken am i right anyways let us move on to a sweet little hound we've got yoshimaru the ever faithful one white mana gets you a legendary heartbreaking dog creature so their ability is, whenever another legendary permanent enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on Yoshimaru, ever faithful. So, so it's got partner as well. Pretty straightforward concept. This is a loyal hound companion, right? And as far as I understand, this is the loyal hound companion of the Emperor. And considering that the Emperor has these planeswalking problems, can't control their coming and going, showing back up here and there, probably is what triggers this increase in power. But overall, a 1-1 one, one for 1 that grows every time a legendary comes out is nothing to sneeze at. This is something that's going to tear it up in Commander. And the card, it tugs on my heartstrings, man. It makes me think of the old Futurama episode, I believe it was called Jurassic Bark, where the dog is just waiting for Fry. Oh, I can't, you know, it's so funny. They did such a good job with that episode that... I don't even know how long it's been since I saw it, but it still is emotionally resonant to me. If you've seen the episode right now, the song that is playing is playing in my head and my eyes are getting moistened. The human's mind ability to connect different things emotionally is incredible. This is a really cool card that also touches me deep in my heart hole. Wait a minute, heart, that doesn't sound right. I gotta get that checked. Okay, so before I go to the doctor, let us talk about the Myogen of Cryptic Dreams. So we had a cycle of Myogens in the original Kamigawa block, and they have done a brand new cycle for the commander decks. Now, truthfully, this newer wave of Myogens doesn't feel as exciting. Most of them are kind of whatever, but this one in particular, I love for its art and its crazy ability. So it's three blue and five. All Myogens have a massive casting cost. They all have this second ability as well, where they enter the battlefield with an indestructible counter as long as you played it from your hand, right? And then you can remove the indestructible counter from a Myogen to get a big powerful effect. In the case of the Myogen of Cryptic Dreams, the powerful effect is to remove the counter and then you get to copy target permanent spell you control three times. So it's important to note that because of the wording, because it says permanent spell, that means you activate this ability while one of your spells is on the stack. So if you had a creature, an enchantment, an artifact, a planeswalker, whatever permanent spell you were going to cast, you would cast it while it's on the stack. In response, you remove the counter from the Myogen and make three copies of that permanent. So this can lead 
to a lot of crazy shenanigans. Getting to copy three permanents is crazy, but getting to ca like copy them while they're in their spell form is both more restrictive, but also in some ways more powerful. And I love the artwork. It's so weird. You have the Myogen, and he's like holding up this like little mask of the face, and there's just this endless line of masked faces going on. And they're sitting up there in the clouds, which really begs the question, how does this card not have flying? I mean, it looks like it's flying. You're floating up in the air. We saw this with the hot tub in Kamigawa as well. It always like tweaks me out a little when I see that they've gone ahead and made it so a creature that should be flying, depicted in the artwork flying, isn't flying. So come on, man. How is that not flying? Anyhow, that wraps up all the cards I wanted to talk about today. Link to the live stream over on my other channel up on the screen. Remember, not for your kids. All right, so thanks for coming by. Got some Kamigawa spoilers up on the screen as well in case you're interested in that. If you want to spend some more time together. Anyhow, thanks for coming by. Big shout out to my patrons. See you next time.